Good morning and welcome back to Sunday School Monday. Uh, our lesson this morning is entitled Reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S, but we're having some of the R-A-I-N-S at present, but it's about reigns. It's taken from Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. If you'll allow me, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll take a look at the text. Precious Holy Father, again, we just come to you thanking you for who you are and what you've done for us. I pray, Father, that uh, you would speak through me the words you want spoken this morning in this lesson, that you would just allow it to touch hearts, change lives, and uh, meet needs for whatever those that hear it might have. We know that uh, you're still on the throne, you're still in control. We thank you for that. We pray that uh, you would just have your perfect way, your perfect will with each one of us, and that, Father, you would just uh, bring unity and harmony back to this nation, that you would uh, have your way. We thank you that you've given us scripture that we can look into and see how you operate and the things that you do. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, you just have your way. That you would just work things out the way you want them worked out. Help us to be obedient and available for service. Now we just pray that you would be with us during this Sunday school hour, that you would uh, have your way. We thank you for it, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name, and amen. All right. Well, this is... Uh, entitled Reigns, Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. So let's take a look at the printed text, and then as usual, we'll come back and we'll talk about it. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pluck some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful? On the Sabbath, Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Let's remember that. That's a key verse right there. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to him, said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. All right. A very exciting verse. It's another teachable moment for Jesus to the instructors of Scripture, the Pharisees and the, and the, uh, the scribes, and they don't get it. And folks, you know, when we read the Bible, we think, well, that was something that was written a long, long time ago. Yes, it was. But it was written by men as directed by God, so it's infallible. 
It's from God, which means it's very worthwhile for today. Even more so, it's an alive document. It's there to help us to understand what it is we're supposed to do. And there's a lot of similarities of what went on then that goes on today. So let's go back and take a look at verse 1. It starts off with one Sabbath. All right, let's first define a Sabbath. Sabbath is not Sunday. Sabbath is Saturday, the seventh day of the week. And according to Mosaic law, the Sabbath day was to remain holy. They were to take that day and use it to glorify God and just dwell on him. Well, basically what they had done <laughs> to help people understand what was originally meant to keep the Sabbath holy, they wrote a whole bunch of other sub-laws to define what that meant. And they called that the Misha. Well, here it says, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. Okay, back in this day and time, it was a very agrarian society. So there were grain fields and there were all kind of uh, gardens and so forth everywhere you went. And <coughs> they weren't fenced off typically, but they would typically have paths through these grain fields so people could walk through them. They didn't just wander around aimlessly in there and destroy the crops. There were paths. And as they would walk through these grain fields, it was actually legal, this was defined, that people could pick off some of the heads and eat if they were hungry. So, you know, you might have some corn there or something, some kind of a grain, and you'd take it and you would take the head and then you would kind of rub it between your hands to get rid of the husk, the chaff, or whatever, and then just eat the kernel. And it was not a fulfilling, but it would satisfy and take, take away the hunger pains. Well, this is what was doing. Jesus and the disciples were walking. There again, you were not allowed to make long journeys, but short trips was okay on the Sabbath. So they were making a short trip. They were cutting through a grain field, and they began to pick up some of the uh, grain and to eat it. Well, as Jesus was walking with the disciples, it looks like there were some other people with him as well, the Pharisees, because it said, some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Okay, so I believe that wherever Jesus went with his disciples, there was a contingency of Pharisees there as well, keeping a close eye on him. Jesus was a threat to their power. Jesus was destroying what they had built up to make themselves powerful, probably wealthy, very well respected, fed their egos. And here comes this man, Jesus, a nobody. Matter of fact, he was from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And maybe that he was a carpenter. He was a nobody. And yet he's challenging them on the very law that they were the experts in, or so-called experts. All right, this Mishnah, which was a collection of rabbinical teachings that were not part of Scripture, it included nearly 40 specific prohibitions related to activities on the Sabbath. So they've taken this keep the Sabbath holy, and they wrote all these little sub-laws, and it says there's about 40 of them, and had them in this binding called the Mishnah. The scribes and Pharisees were more interested in the letter of the law than the spiritual intention behind it. I've always said that when we do something that other people view as either good or bad, they need to not look at what we did so much as why we did it. Because that's what God looks at, is what was the motivation in us doing something either that was perceived in some eyes as good or perceived in some eyes as bad. Because the true meaning is what was the motivation behind that activity. Well, here, the Pharisees and the scribes were more interested in making sure that everybody obeyed the law as they interpreted it 
than what their motivation was for doing what they were doing. I can remember a church that I was a member of years and years ago. And as you go through kids, they have different classes, you know, like the, the tod babies, the toddlers, whatever. They would have ages that they would be in. Then they would be, when they had a birthday, they'd be promoted to the next class. Well, uh, I knew a lady that was adamant about that. As soon as that birthday hit, you're out of here. It doesn't matter if their friends were still left there that they were with. When they had that birthday, they had to go. And that caused some problems because it upset a lot of the kids and upset a lot of the parents. Well, she was being going by the letter of the law instead of basically the intent in trying to work with somebody. And I'm not saying she was bad, it's just she was going by the rules. And we see that a lot. But sometimes there's other motivation involved. Here's a situation where this is exactly what's going on. These disciples, and we notice that it didn't say that Jesus plucked any of the grain, but the disciples did. You say, wait a minute, Mike. They're stealing grain out of somebody else's field. No, no, they're not. This was provided for in the law that they could do this. They could cut through the field, and they could actually pick off some of the heads and eat them. This, this, was, this was legal. But it doesn't say that Jesus did, that the disciples did it. And then here are these Pharisees that are following Jesus everywhere he goes, to try to catch him in doing something wrong. They're bound and determined to cancel him. Cancel? That's a term we're using today. There's a lot of people being canceled because their views are different from those that are in power or in control. Uh, I'm seeing a very, very sad trend with free speech diminishing unless that speech agrees with those that control it. You look at some of the platforms that I've been reading about, a lot of people that were on Twitter, they've been banned. A lot of people on uh, Facebook have been banned. If you don't meet the standards of those people that are in control, then you're out. Well, what are those standards? Well, that's the point. Uh, it might be different than what you view with what they view, and they're in control and they get to make the decision. Well, is that free speech? Not really. He said, well, I could maybe be doing something that could hurt somebody. Possibly, but then there's other people on there that have a lot of things that are hurtful that are left alone because of a certain way they view it. And anyway, we'll not get into all that. But here, they were trying to cancel Jesus because Jesus was going against <coughs> the establishment. And he was destroying, in their mind, their power base. Well, this position of, of being a Pharisee or a, a scribe or whatever was not meant to be a powerful position for you to enrich yourself. It was a position of work for you to take the gospel and, or the, the Bible, the teachings, and bring it to the people. What the original intent was from God, and they perverted it. Well... Moving along, they picked up the grain, and the Pharisees saw it, and they, uh, they were asking, why are you doing to the disciples what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So here again, they think they've got them nailed, and they're, they're asking this. Well, just remember, some people are more interested in maintaining religious traditions above everything else. We've got to do it to the letter of the law. I, I've seen people that just absolutely will take a Bible and beat you over the head with it because you're not doing it the way it says in the Bible. Now, is that going to bless you? No, it's probably going to run you off. I've heard of a lot of people that say, well, I'm not going to go to that church because they're just too mean. Uh, of course, a lot of people, you know, said, I'm not going to go to church because I don't like peanut butter. What do you mean by that? Well, one excuse is good as another. <laughs> I'm just not going to go to church because I just want to do other things. Okay, you have that prerogative. But folks, let me tell you something. I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he did come to earth, was born of a virgin, lived 33 and a half years. He was crucified. He was buried. He came back to life and showed himself 
And then he ascended to heaven and he sitteth on the right hand of God right now to make intercession for you and me. And I believe that he is coming back again. And I believe we are fastly approaching that time. Uh, I'm not setting a date. Nobody knows except for God. But I will tell you, it's one day closer today than it was yesterday. Now, you think, well, I've got plenty of time to get ready. Maybe, maybe not. What if while you're waiting for him to come back and waiting to make that decision to follow him, you have a heart attack, an aneurysm, something that takes you out just like that. You're just a heartbeat away from eternity. Don't put it off. If God's speaking to you and you feel that tugging at your heart, that uncomfortableness, that's God saying, please accept me. And then all you got to do is admit you're a sinner, ask God to forgive you and save you, and he will. All right, let's look down verse 3 and 5. Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He does battle with scripture. These guys know the scripture. They study the scripture. They know it very well inside and out. So he's going to bring to their attention a situation. And I think it's beautiful the way he uses the scriptures to do that. He said, he, meaning David, entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Pharisees, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. <coughs> Pardon me, there's a lot of stuff crammed in here. All right, so Jesus, when the Pharisees asked the disciples, hey, you're breaking the Sabbath, he jumps in and he uh, answered them and he said he wanted the Pharisees to understand a greater spiritual truth. They're looking at the superficial words and they're using that to beat over the heads of those that don't do exactly the way they think they should. But Jesus is going to open up the meaning of the scripture. He's going to go deeper than just superficial value and explain some things to them, giving them another opportunity to accept him. Okay, so he brings it to their attention a passage in the Old Testament, which is actually 1 Samuel 13 and 14. David and his men were fleeing from Saul, who was the king. People were wanting to make David king. Well, there was also, Saul was very jealous of David because of all that David was doing. So he was trying to kill him. And David was on the run trying to get away from Saul. And as he's going out, he's hungry. And he comes across a, uh, a little church, if you will. The, uh, the temple was not built as of yet. There was a tabernacle somewhere in this town. I think the town they called it was Nob, which was not too far away from Jerusalem. And he goes in, and every week there's 12 loaves of bread that are presented to God, as they call the showbread, and uh, it's consecrated. And the only people that can eat that bread through the law are the priests. David's hungry. He goes in and asks for help. Well, this priest, David asks for five loaves, and the priest gives him all 12 of them. And so David eats, and he takes back, and it gives to his men and gives them to, to give them sustenance, to give them nourishment, because they're going to die if they don't have any food. David's going to end up being king. God wants that to happen. Saul's trying to kill him. He's trying to get away. He needs food for strength. So God says, this is okay to do this. And this is what he's trying to point out to the Pharisees, that yes, that's what the law says, but sometimes there's a greater good involved. And he said, as a matter of fact, the Son of Man, identifying himself, is Lord of the Sabbath. Well, they also know that that term Son of Man is a reference to the Messiah. And here Jesus said, I am the Son of Man, the Messiah, and I'm also the Lord of the Sabbath thus equating himself equal to God who created the Sabbath. Well, <laughs> he's really stirring up the pot right here. But he's not doing it being mean or vindictive. He's trying to get them to understand, number one, who he is and what the scriptures actually mean when you apply it 
to the different situations that arise. Well, we go on down here and uh, see uh, verse 6 and 7. It says, on another Sabbath. So he's getting ready to give them another example. Now, one thing Luke does, Luke does not go with a day-by-day uh, -day activity uh, list roster of what Jesus does. He changes things up. But here he just says, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. All right, so basically, he's probably in the same area of where he stays, and he goes into this tabernacle that uh, or synagogue that, that's there in this area, and he must be a regular, that they must know what he, who he is, because it says, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, so he had free reign, and so the... Uh, rabbi there of that uh, synagogue probably knew who he was and allowed him to come in and speak on numerous occasions whenever he wanted to. So he takes an opportunity here to go into this synagogue on this Saturday, this Sabbath, and teach. Well, it said there was a man there whose right hand was shriveled. All right, well, let's see what that word shriveled mean. It describes a limb that was paralyzed and withered from disease. It just didn't work. And this hand was just inoperative and it was just something that was there and it was just a, a lifeless limb that he couldn't use. Well, he'd probably been that way from birth. Now, did Jesus know he was going to be there when he went in? Maybe. Doesn't identify. Did the Pharisees know he was going to be there when they went in? Don't know. They could have set this up. They could have said, hey, we want you to be in the synagogue this particular Sunday. I really don't know. It doesn't go into a lot of that, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is the situation is here right now. Jesus is there teaching. The man with the shriveled hand is there, and the Pharisees are there. And the Pharisees, it says, uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse God. Jesus. They're, the, they're not there to hear what Jesus has to say, to listen to his teaching. They're there, not there to support the local rabbi. They're not there for any reason other than to find a way to get Jesus. That's all they're there for. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. So it sounds to me like this is possibly a setup that they arranged this situation, that this guy would be there when Jesus was there teaching. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But it says they were watching to see what Jesus was going to do. Well, it could be that Jesus might have even known who this man was and seen him before. But he didn't choose to heal him at that point. But today's a different day. And there's a different message to be proclaimed right here. It's a teachable moment for a lot of people. The man with the shriveled hand, the attendants there in the synagogue, as well as the spiritual leaders, the Pharisees. Everybody had the reason for being there. Some were pure and some were not so pure. Well, the religious leaders' antagonistic attitude revealed itself as they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Normally, people who have ill intent will expose themselves. You can see things, and, you know, I don't like to get into political stuff because it doesn't really, I've got too many friends on both sides of the aisle that I think a lot of. But I believe we can see a lot of people who have ulterior motives being exposed through different things as we watch closely. The Pharisees exposed their intent. They're supposed to be the religious leaders, the guys that are smart, that are to instruct and to teach the ways of God. But they've exposed themselves as they're hypocrites. They have a, they're power hungry. They love the praise of men, so they have egos. Uh, they want everybody to bow down to them and listen to what they have to say. In other words, do as I say and not as I do. Well, they expose themselves. So we go to verse 8 and 9. 
And it says, but Jesus knew what they were thinking. Now, I just find that fascinating because you got to realize God, Jesus is the God man. He's fully God, and yet he's fully man in the man Jesus. Now, I can't really explain that because I have a finite mind, and this is an infinite concept. But here, Jesus knows what they're thinking. So, he said to the man with the shriveled hand, the stage is set. The showdown is about to occur. So he's there. The Pharisees are there. He knows what they're thinking, that they're looking for an excuse to get him. So he sees the, shrivel, the man with the shriveled hand, and he says to him, get up and stand in front of everyone. All right, now, <clears throat> he's getting ready to put him on the spot. Now, this poor guy, probably with a shriveled hand, is not very productive. He's probably kind of shunned. He probably is very bashful, shy, backward because of his disability. And he's in the synagogue. Not sure why. Was he invited or does he normally come every Saturday and he's just there? I don't really know, but it doesn't matter. But he's there, and all of a sudden, this visiting teacher points him out specifically and says, stand up and get up here in front of everybody. Now, some people would just absolutely want to pass out because they didn't want attention drawn to him. He might have been that way. But it said that he got up and stood there. He obeyed Jesus. There was something about Jesus and the way that he said things, especially when he's calling you. When Jesus calls you, the best thing you can do is say, here am I, Lord, and obey. Because there's something good going to happen when he's calling you. So he calls this man out of the audience, and he tells him to stand up and come up in front of everybody. So he did it. He got up and he stood there. And then Jesus said to them, to the Pharisees, I ask you, in other words, I'm going to make you go on record right now as to what your belief is, what your motivation is, and what you're thinking. So he said, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Now remember, he knew that the Pharisees were sitting there thinking, is he going to heal this guy? If he does, we get him for working on the Sabbath. If he doesn't, he's not compassionate. He probably don't even have the power to do anything anymore. He's probably lost it. So they think they've got him cornered. But Jesus is very, very wise. He looked at them point blank and he said, I ask you, you got to give me an answer. Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Because he identified what the good and the evil was, to save life or to destroy it. So he asked him that question point blank, and then he stood there and looked at him. It says in verse 10, he looked around at them all, waiting for an answer. They were cowards. They weren't going to answer him. They couldn't. They didn't have the good answer. If they said, well, to do good, okay, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to heal him. But they're not going to say to do evil. Now, was this man's hand in a situation where he was about to die from it? No. But his hand kept him from living a, an abundant life because he couldn't produce. So by Jesus healing him, it can change his life dramatically. Now, something else about Jesus. A lot of times when Jesus would heal somebody, he would touch them. You know, he made a little spittle and put it in the dust and made some mud, put it on a guy's eyes, and he, he laid on top of, you know, the, touched people and did different things, lifted them up. There's all kinds of ways that people were healed. But here, he's going to be a little different. It says, he looked around to them all, and then he said to the man 
stretch out your hand. Okay, remember the guy's still standing up in front of the church. And everybody's probably looking at him. They're looking at Jesus. They're looking at the Pharisees. Jesus got everybody's attention. Like, what's getting ready to happen? So he tells the man with the withered hand, he said, stretch out your hand. He wanted the man to do something that enacted his faith. Now, he was probably embarrassed. It was probably a little shriveled up. Who knows what it looked like, but it could it just something that was probably something he kept hid. And Jesus is saying, stretch out your hand in front of everybody right here, right now. Stretch out your hand. He did so. He didn't say, Lord, why? But he didn't, none of that. It just says he did so. And his hand was completely restored. When did his hand become restored? Was it before he stretched it out? Was it while he was stretching it out? Was it after he stretched it out? Doesn't really say. But I believe when you look at these verbs and you look at them, I think it was as, a, as an act of his obedience, his faith, that as he stretched it out, it became whole at that point. That's just kind of what I, I think by the way the syntax of the words and everything else. But I believe as he stepped out in faith and did what Jesus said by stretching that hand out, God healed it. All right? But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious. Now let's just stop right there. We just saw a miracle that probably people in this synagogue knew this man, they knew his condition, and they just saw his hand completely restored. A miracle. Just wow. So they're probably just, oh my goodness. And can you imagine how the man must have felt? I mean, he's probably looking, he's probably doing all, he's all excited. But yet it says that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious. Well, let me just tell you something. That word furious the term furious translates a word meaning without thought and could be rendered or translated, they lost their minds. <laughs> their anger was so great, they started to lose control. They blew a gasket. They just were beside themselves with anger at what Jesus just did. Number one, it wasn't so much that he healed them, but that he embarrassed them. He put them in their place. They were trying to take Jesus down, and Jesus turned it around on them and made them look bad. That is what made them so mad. <laughs> Not that he actually healed the guy. They, that didn't matter to them. They did what they were going to do. They wanted to get rid of him, but he embarrassed them. And that drove them crazy. And it says that they began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. So I believe they left. They just tucked tail and ran one out. And then they started saying, he's got to go. That's it. We're done. No more Mr. Nice Guy. We're going to take him out. We're not going to just cancel him. We're going to cancel him permanently. He has got to go. Now, I want to point out something to you. The evil intent of the Pharisees contrasts with the good Jesus did. Both things happening on the Sabbath. Jesus did good on the Sabbath. They did evil. Their anger seethed. Jesus went back over into verse uh, 9, and he said, you know, which is it? Uh, is it... Uh, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? Jesus did good. They did evil. Jesus preserved life. They are figuring out a way to destroy life, Jesus' life. You see the dichotomy right there? These were the religious leaders, the ones in charge of everybody's spiritual welfare. And yet they're wanting to kill Jesus because he did something good on the Sabbath. Folks, God loves you more than you can ever imagine. There's nothing you can do or did or will do that God can't forgive you for. Please, 
Ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you today if you've never done that. That'll be the greatest decision you'll ever make. He is coming back, and he's coming back for his own. And if you're saved, you get to go. If you're not, you're going to go through hell on earth. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be brutal. And it's just something that we don't even want to think about. But we have to. The choice is yours. Accept Jesus or reject Jesus. It's your choice. God made it so you could have the free will just to decide. I pray you accept him. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week.